What is up guys, welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. I'm your host, Wadislav, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about the uh, latest developments in the US versus Maxwell case. So let's get started. All right, so what we're gonna be doing today is looking at the fruits of the Daubert hearing that took place on November 10th, which I told you guys about in my last video, where we talked about the uh, the grooming issue and how Ghislaine Maxwell's lawyers are planning to attack uh, the victims and their memories, etc. So if you missed that video, go check it out. It was regarding Ghislaine Maxwell's trial strategy. I'll link it in the top right hand corner right now. But in this video, we're going to be going deep into the Daubert hearing that happened and the judge put out her order and opinion here and we're going to be going through it. And I'm going to break down everything that happened in the Daubert hearing. And the judge basically ruled in the government's favor and allowed Dr. Lisa Rocio, who is the expert that we're talking about here, to testify at trial with a small little restriction, which I'm not really concerned about, but I'll explain all that as we go forward. So before the court is the defense's motion to exclude the government's expert witness, Dr. Lisa Rocio, pursuant to Federal Rule of Evidence 702 and the standard in Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, which was a Supreme Court from 1993, which set the Daubert standard in place. Uh, we, I talked about the Daubert standard in my last video as well, and you can also just Google it if you don't know, if you want to know what it is. Uh, basically, it's a way to um, test the validity of expert testimony. That's in short what it is. The court conducted a Daubert hearing on November 10th, 2021, at which both parties examined Dr. Rocio and her purported uh, opinions, right? They want to examine if the opinions were um, valid according to the Daubert standard and the federal rules of evidence 702. So let's go over the legal standard really fast because it's going to be relevant to understanding um, the outcome of this uh, this decision by the judge. So the legal standard, according to Federal Rule of Evidence 702, governs the admissibility of expert testimony. That rule states the following, a witness who is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify in the form of an opinion or otherwise if A, the expert's scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will help the trier of fact, that's the jury, trier of fact, um, to understand the evidence or to determine a fact in issue. So this is, this goes directly to what Dr. Rocho is trying to do. The common man does not understand the concept of grooming. It is not something that's widely known by people. Most people don't, you know, regular people, even myself, before these last two years, I never knew what it was because who the hell looks into sex trafficking? Most people are not involved in that. Most people don't want to know anything about that. It's kind of sick and disgusting. Thing. So most people don't know anything. So Dr. Rocio will be uh, instrumental in helping the jury understand from an expert's point of view, and she has decades of experience working with trauma victims, victims of sex abuse so, and sex trafficking. So she will be uh, a relevant expert with scientific technical and other knowledge to help uh, the trier of fact, that's the jury, to understand the evidence that's going to be presented, the arguments that are going to be presented by the defense, and to understand the facts that are going to be presented by the government. So in my mind, an expert like Lisa Rocio is absolutely necessary in this trial for the jury to understand the facts clearly. Let's keep on going here. B, the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data. C, the testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. And D, the expert has reliably applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. So those are the standards, the basic standards you have to meet. This is the judge. The court exercises a gatekeeper function in accessing the admissibility of expert testimony. To determine whether an expert's method is reliable, the court considers the non-exhaustive list provided by the Supreme Court in Daubert, including whether the expert's method has been tested, whether it has been subject to peer review, the rate of error, standards controlling the method's operation, and whether the method is accepted by the expert community. This is all to make sure that some crackpot theory that a couple people or a couple hundred people believe, but is not largely accepted by the scientific community. It's a way to keep the conspiracy theories out because a lot of, lot of people have lots of ideas, okay? But they have not been peer reviewed and they're not accepted by the larger scientific community because most of the time they're not true. Now, if it turns out that in the future we find out that some of these theories are true, then it will be accepted by the larger scientific community. Science takes time, that's true, um, and it will become common knowledge. But right now, in, in the uh, moment of time when this trial is taking place, a Daubert hearing, I believe, is 
warranted. And as a scientist myself, I support the Daubert hearing uh, and I support the uh, standards set by Rule 702 because we need admissible and scientifically valid ideas being presented in court. We can't have lunatic conspiracy theories putting out any idea they want without any, any kind of scientific uh, corroboration. So according to the uh, Rule 702 standard and the Daubert standard, the uh, judge reviewed the expert opinions that are going to be proffered at trial by Dr. Rocio, and uh, she lists, lists them here. So we're going to go through them, and then she goes on to break down whether um, these are admissible in trial. Okay, so let's get started. Dr. Rocio uh, offers five basic opinions that she's going to she's gonna be presenting to the jury. First, that perpetrators of sexual abuse of minors frequently use manipulation or coercion short of physical force as part of a strategic pattern often referred to as grooming to make the minor vulnerable to abuse. Okay, so that's one of the most uh, one of the most important and material opinions that she's going to offer because that's relevant to what Ghislaine Maxwell did and what happened to the victims of Jeffrey Epstein. Okay, so that's absolutely one hundred percent relevant to the facts of this case. Okay, second, that manipulation and grooming can prevent the minor from understanding their experience as abuse and so prevent disclosure. And this is absolutely true. And it happened with Jeffrey Epstein when it comes to Courtney Wilde. She was uh, Jeffrey Epstein got to her when she was 14 years old. And this exact thing that she that the judge describes here happened to Courtney Wilde. So this opinion is also very relevant to this case, although Courtney Wilde is not one of the victims that the government is going to bring uh, in this trial. But nevertheless, you guys get my point. It's relevant to the manipulation that took place with all these girls. OK, third, that abuse can cause long term traumatic and psychological consequences. Um, I don't think anybody uh, disputes that. Right. So I think that opinion is 100 percent valid. Um, fourth, that the presence of another individual can facilitate sexual abuse of minors. And fifth, that non-disclosure, incremental disclosure and secrecy are common among victims of sexual abuse and that memory can be affected by a variety of factors, including the effects of trauma. And that's also absolutely true. These victims do not automatically disclose everything right away. Uh, there is incremental disclosure. There is secrecy because they're worried about whether there's going to be retaliation or they're going to be harmed in some way or their families are going to be harmed in some way. A lot of sex trafficking victims from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, they, they are threatened by their families being harmed back in the old country. This is how they do it, especially in Slavic countries and countries like Albania. These mafias and these gangsters who do sex trafficking, they rely on threats of physical violence against families to keep these victims quiet. So there are many reasons why the victims of sex trafficking and sexual abuse do not report right away, why they only tell certain parts of their story, why they're uh, prone to secrecy. These are all things that are understood by people who actually been studying this phenomenon and have actually talked to these women. OK, so there you go. Let's keep on going here. The defense does not contest that Dr. Rocio has the qualifications to express opinions on these subjects. Dr. Rocio has a Ph.D. in clinical psychology and is a clinical instructor at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. She has more than two decades of experience treating hundreds of victims of trauma, many of which were minor victims of sexual abuse. She has published peer reviewed articles on trauma and sexual abuse and has given numerous talks in addition to her teaching. Given these papers, Papers and her credible and extensive hearing testimony, the court therefore finds Dr. Rocio qualified as an expert. So the Rule 702 standard has been met, and she is a credible scientific expert. That's what she's ruling here. She continues to say the court rejects the defense's argument that Dr. Rocio's method is unreliable because she relied on reports of her clients. Given the realities of studying sensitive criminal acts like sexual abuse, a researcher can only rarely verify reports with absolute certainty. Yet that does not mean a clinical or forensic psychologist accepts all statements at face value. Rather, as the government notes, part of Dr. Rocio's profession is to examine and diagnose knows her patients consistent with her significant training and specialized knowledge. Further, on the forensic side of her practice, Dr. Rocio regularly investigates and verifies sexual abuse. She reports, quote, remarkable consistency, unquote, between the reports of her clinical patients, 
and her forensic findings. That said, the defense is, of course, free to cross-examine Dr. Rocio about how she evaluates her patients. So that section was about the defense claiming that there's no way for a clinical psychologist like Dr. Rocio to actually verify the accounts of the victims that she's talked to. And that's what this whole section was about. They were trying to say that there's no scientific validity to her claims because she was not able to verify every single accusation that was made to her. So she talks to victims of sex abuse and they say that this and this and this happened to them. And the defense is saying that there's no way for Dr. Rocio to verify that X, Y, and Z happened to that victim. So they're saying that she should be excluded because she is not the police or the district attorney or the state attorney. She doesn't have any prosecutorial power. She's not the police. So she can't do an investigation. Therefore, as a scientist, her uh, testimony is not reliable because the patients that she's talked to during her career, she was not able to verify their stories. This is ridiculous. This would make every single scientist, every single psychologist completely inadmissible at trial because the psychologist is not a police officer. They're not the DA's office. They don't do investigations into the backgrounds of uh, the victims. What they do is they listen to the trauma that the victims have suffered. And most of the time, these girls are not lying. Okay. They may have lapses in memory when they're talking to a psychologist, but usually people don't outright make up this kind of abuse. They don't make or waste thousands of dollars going to a psychologist to get help if they're just lying about their sexual abuse. Okay. So the very idea that they they brought up this this uh this defense is ridiculous they're trying to invalidate talk therapy or anything close close to it basically saying that no forensic psychologist or psychologist or psychiatrist's um a testimony is admissible at court that is insane Okay, and that's why the judge rejected it. Next, the defense argues that Dr. Rocho's experience treating victims of sexual abuse does not make her an expert on grooming, which would require expertise with perpetrators themselves. This argument overlooks the fact she has testified Dr. Rocio also relied on literature that includes studies of sexual abusers' reported behaviors. But more importantly, the court concludes, as other courts like the Ninth Circuit have, that extensive experience with victims can be used to study perpetrators process of victimization. So they were trying to say that because Dr. Rocio had not spoken or studied in detail, the perpetrators themselves, meaning she hadn't talked to enough people like Jeffrey Epstein, so therefore her testimony is not credible. That's what they were trying to say, and the judge laughed that off because that's ridiculous. <laughs> you can understand the mindset of the predator by talking to the, to the victim themselves because the victim will tell you exactly what the predator did, and that's what she says here. So I love the fact that Judge Nathan is studied on the, the, the facts of cases like this, and I'm really impressed with her adjudica adjudication of this case. She's being very, very knowledgeable in the subject that she's presiding over. So I'm very impressed. The judge goes on to say, Rocio's first and second opinions may assist the jury in understanding how a minor may be enticed, induced, or coerced into illegal sexual activity without physical force. These opinions may also assist a jury in assessing evidence that some alleged victims repeatedly interacted with Jeffrey Epstein, seemingly voluntarily, even after they suffered abuse. Dr. Rocio's fourth opinion is similarly relevant to the charges that require proving intentional enticement or inducement. So, like I said before with Courtney Wilde, she kept going back to Jeffrey Epstein because she had a broken family life. She didn't have a she didn't have any financial security. He gave her a place to stay, stay and a stipend. So even though Courtney Wilde was being abused by Jeffrey Epstein, she kept going back to him. So I'm using Courtney Wilde as an example because I know the most about her case. So Courtney Wilde is just a template to understand the actions of the uh, of the perpetrators here and how victims react to that abuse. And that's what Dr. Rocho is going to be talking about. That's why her her testimony is relevant and material to the trier of fact, the jury, understanding this case. Okay, it's important. Next, Dr. Rocio's third and fifth opinions pertain to issues that will arise in the case based on anticipated cross-examination by the defense. Specifically, the third opinion becomes relevant if the defense impeaches an alleged victim based on their substance abuse, and the fifth opinion may be relevant if the defense impeaches an alleged victim based on the ostensible delay in fully disclosing sexual abuse. At the Daubert hearing, the defense stated that they intended to pursue both lines of impeachment at trial. 
meaning that they're going to claim some of the victims were drunks and that they didn't report the abuse fast enough. That's what they're talking about here. And um, and at the Daubert hearing, uh, the defense stated that they're going to pursue both lines of attacks, both both of those lines of attack. OK, that's what the judge is talking about there. The court therefore finds these elements of Dr. Rocio's testimony relevant to matters the defense intends to put in issue during anticipated uh, cross-examination. The court also concludes that these opinions satisfy the other relevant Daubert requirements. Namely, they would assist the jury in understanding concepts that require expert knowledge without directing the jury to reach any conclusion as to witness credibility. Additionally, both Dr. Rocio's opinion about sexual abuse's connection to substance abuse and her opinion about delayed disclosure are, quote, outside the ken of an average person and so appropriate for expert testimony. So what the judge said there is that Dr. Rocio's opinion regarding what happens to um, victims after they have been abused, which is that they engage in risk taking behavior, which is something that happens with sexual abuse victims. The doctor's testimony is going to be uh, important to understanding that and also the fact that disclosures are delayed uh, for sexual abuse victims. That's also a fact that is accepted by the scientific community. All of those facts are going to be um, explained by Dr. Rocio, and that's going to be important because these facts are outside of the ken of the average person, meaning that the common man doesn't necessarily have all the understanding of what happens to the psychology of a sexual abuse victim. So it's important for Dr. Rocio to explain explain that to the jury. That's what she's saying there. So her testimony is 100% relevant to the facts at hand. Next, the probative value of Dr. Rocio's testimony is not substantially outweighed by the 403 prejudice to Ms. Maxwell. The court finds that Dr. Rocio's testimony would not unduly simplify an otherwise complex case or mislead jurors by a supposedly infallible expert. So what she's referring to here is the fact that Gillian Maxwell's side tried to argue that Dr. Rocio's testimony will be more, more prejudicial to give Gillian Maxwell than probative for the case. Um, and the probative versus prejudicial test is something that the judge has to administer. The, the question that the judge asks is, does Dr. Rocio's testimony prejudice, unduly prejudice the jury against Gillian Maxwell? Or does the testimony help them arrive at a just conclusion about the facts in the case? And the judge is saying here that Dr. Rocio's testimony is not unduly prejudicial. And she's saying that the testimony of Dr. Dr. Rocio will instead help the jury understand the facts of this case in a fair way that will help them arrive at a just conclusion. OK, so that's what the judge concluded. And lastly, the court will grant in part the defense's Daubert motion. The defense argues that Dr. Rocio's opinion that grooming can be done to facilitate sexual abuse by a third party or that the presence of a third party can otherwise facilitate grooming is unreliable. The defense calls this grooming by proxy. Terminology aside, the court agrees with the narrow objection to Dr. Rocio's testimony. As discussed at the hearing, this phenomenon is not identified in the the relevant literature regarding child sexual abuse and has not been subjected to peer review. Instead, the court understands his opinion to be an extrapolation of the broader principle of how grooming functions through the development of trust. That extrapolation may be logical and follows common sense, as I said in my previous video, but it is for the jury to make on the facts of this case. The court therefore excludes Dr. Rocio's opinion that the presence of a third party can facilitate grooming. Dr. Rocio's core opinion about grooming, however, can remain admissible under Rule 702 and Daubert Standard and remain relevant pursuant to Rule 401 and not unduly prejudicial. So what she's saying there is the idea of grooming by proxy is not in any scientific uh, literature. It's not peer reviewed, so they can't present that idea. But nevertheless, she's saying that the logical and common sense idea that Gillian Maxwell was trying to, you know, entice these girls to come and be with Jeffrey Epstein, that part is still common sense. But nevertheless, they can't specifically refer to this grooming by proxy idea and say that just because she was present uh, with, with some of the girls doesn't necessarily mean that they were groomed. So it's a kind of, you know, shifty ground there. But nevertheless, I think it was a fair, um, fair ruling by the judge. Uh, she's saying that the logical 
common sense conclusions can be drawn from what the government is saying, but they can't specifically refer to the idea of grooming by proxy. So the judge is kind of splitting the baby here. She's kind of ruling in favor of Maxwell, but at the same time, not really, because the idea of grooming is still valid and may be presented by Dr. Rocio. And most of what we talked about here has been allowed by the judge. So I'm not really worried about the fact that this specific idea of grooming by proxy will not be introduced. I think the government will be able to make their case without specifically referring to uh, the grooming by proxy idea. Okay, so because grooming itself as an idea will be introduced as a valid concept by Dr. Rocio, and the jury will draw the, the logical conclusions about exactly what Gill and Maxwell did. Okay, like she says here, the extrapolation may be logical and follow common sense because it does. Okay, these victims don't fall into the hands of these predators magically. Somebody recruits them, somebody shows them either fake or feigned kindness, like Ghislaine Maxwell did, and brings these girls to these predators. So people know that after um, Dr. Rocio is done explaining the 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 way that these uh, victimization schemes work, the way that these abusers work, the jury will have a have a common sense understanding of exactly what Gill and Maxwell participated in when she worked with Jeffrey Epstein. So I'm not too worried about this, okay? And uh, lastly, the court therefore denies the defense's motion to exclude Dr. Rocho's testimony, except as to the opinion that the presence of a third party can facilitate grooming. So we went through everything there. Mostly the government got everything they wanted, uh, save for this facilitation of grooming thing or the uh, grooming by proxy idea we just discussed. But like I said before, it doesn't really damage the government's case. The jury can still logically infer the idea of grooming by proxy without Dr. Rocio talking about it. So even though her opinion on this concept is excluded, I think the jury can draw their logical conclusion and common sense conclusion regarding exactly what Gill and Maxwell was doing. OK, so I'm not too worried about it. And I don't think any of you guys should be either. And that brings us to the end of this particular update. I think the judge did a good job here. I'm very impressed with her understanding of the relevant facts of this case, and I think her judgments were rational, science-based, and beyond reproach. All right, guys, so that's all I got to say for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for future videos if you want to keep up with my content. And if you want to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. There's a link in the description box down below and also in the end of the video during the credits. And if you want to support me on YouTube, you can do so by joining channel memberships by clicking the blue join button down below. With that being said, I'll see you guys next time. As always, peace. Inhabitants of Pink Trees. This is Judge Dredd. In case some people have forgotten, Mama is not the law. I am the law. Mama is a common criminal, guilty of murder, and as of now, under sentence of death. Any who obstruct me in carrying out my duty will be treated as an accessory to our crimes. You have been warned. And as for you, Mama, judgment time.